Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully, you all can see me out there um, in uh, Santa Monica Reeds land. Um, uh, many of you probably already know me. My name is Robert Graves. Um, I am the former chair of Santa Monica Reeds. Um, this is our 19th year um, doing this uh, program, and um, we've had a, some pretty eclectic choices throughout the years, um, starting with uh, the ICG way back um, 19 years ago. We've had Khaled Hosseini's uh, The Kite Runner. Uh, we've had RJ Palacio's Wonder. We've had a children's book. We've had um, uh, Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give. Uh, last year, we had the library book. Farewell to Manzanar. Um, many of you have been with us for many, many years, um, and we really appreciate you all coming out and kind of sharing a love of reading and uh, uh, community discussions and kind of building community through uh, um, sh our shared love of reading. Um, this year, our book is uh, The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. Emma Donahue. <laughs> I learned how to pronounce it correctly, who's here with us uh, from. Uh, um, London, Ontario, right? That's right, though. I'm actually speaking to you from Dublin tonight. I'm oh. here for the filming of one of my books, The Wonder. So I got uh -huh. to visit set yesterday. So thrilling. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's, uh, I have a note, note about that. So, so let me go ahead and do an introduction of Emma. Um, Emma got her start in 1993, I believe, with uh, Passions Between Women, which is one of three works of literary history she's written so far. Um, she's written eight plays, including a couple ad adaptations of her novels and short story collections. Uh, she's published at least four short story collections, as well as a short story ebook in 2011. Uh, she has also written a uh, children's book series, The Lotteries, uh, in which there are two installments. Are there more of those? Or maybe? <laughs> Only in my imagination. Okay. So many series. <laughs> Don't continue past the second. <laughs> Great. And um, and so far, 11 novels, including um, many award-winning uh, The first novel, Stir Fry, in 1994, to what was probably a big breakthrough for you with Slammerkin in 2000, um, onto uh, your best-selling hit, Room, um, in 2010, which you wrote the Oscar-nominated screenplay for several years later. Um, recent works have included Frog Music, which is a thrilling, um, almost mystery novel um, about a, the murder of, in 1876, of Jenny Bonnet, who is kind of a transgender pioneer. Um, and The Wonder, uh, about uh, the baffling fasting girl phenomenon in which young girls stopped eating and subsisted on manna from heaven. And as you mentioned, that's um, starting filming right now. Um, you wrote this. You co-wrote the script for that again, so <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see how that comes out. Um, um, I know uh, filming right now in COVID land is probably difficult all around. So hopefully, uh, we're wishing you all the best of luck. Uh, that film will star uh, Florence Pugh and Valgar, um, and it's your second feature, like I said, after the adaptation, Oscar-nominated adaptation of Room. And that brings us up to um, probably an almost eerily uh, prescient uh, novel, The Pull of the Stars. So um, welcome, Emma. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, from Dublin. What time is it in Dublin? <laughs> it's um, 10 at night. Oh, Not okay. too bad. Well, I have an event okay. in a couple of weeks that's at midnight. So, you know, oh, yours is a yeah. nice afternoon <laughs> slot, which translates into 10 at night for me. Great. Well, at least we're not keeping up till the wee morning. Um, so, uh, can you start out with um, telling us about the origins of the Pull of Stars? How did how did it come about? And... Sure. Um, I it's been kind of embarrassing to have a novel published with such, in publishing terms, lucky timing. Because the last thing I thought I was doing was writing about contemporary life. Um, I would say about two thirds of my novels are uh, historical fiction, and I love the kind of grip of fact. Um, I, I love that element of the real. Um, so I've often chosen obscure moments in cultural history. And oddly enough, even though the, the great flu of 1918 um, was a big deal, it's hardly a secret, but it's never got its fair share of attention. It was sort of overshadowed by World War One. I. I often think if it had happened in 1930, it would have really loomed large, but it got almost forgotten as this just terrible, weird new horror. <laughs> that broke out worldwide at the end of World War II. So um, I, I literally read an article about it and thought, 
I should write something about that flu. That sounds really interesting because these were such modern city lives in many cases that suddenly ground to a halt um, under the privations of the great flu. So um, I thought um, I would take purely fictional characters this time because I thought the flu was fact enough for me to be dealing with, you know, the, the need to be medically accurate, for instance. I knew I'd have to do a great deal of medical research. And um, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll write a novel which will be about 100 years ago, but of course we'll, we'll have some timeless elements to it. So maybe modern readers will find it interesting. And so I wrote the novel and then, you know, finished the very final draft of the publishers and looked up and blinked and there was COVID. And this was early March, 2020. And um, my publishers said that they wanted to rush the book out by July. And I, I felt honestly embarrassed that anyone would think I was trying to take advantage of this crisis. But then as soon as we started publishing the novel, I realized that this would give me the chance to talk about how healthcare workers and how amazing they are. So I stopped thinking of it as me selling my book. And I started thinking of it as how lucky am I to be part of these discussions about healthcare and um, healthcare and injustice and how they're bound up in each other and how whether it's 1918 or 2021 the same awful truths need to be told over and over about people's inability to deal with the facts of science people's inability to truly care about those who are impoverished um, about about how a pandemic acts as a kind of a x-ray of its society you know, showing the sort of under underlying um, inequalities that are going on. So, so I've absolutely loved promoting this book because it doesn't feel like it's about me at all. It feels like it's about your mother, your your neighbor, your nurse. Right. Um, do you kind of shake your head at like how resonant, like so many elements of the book, like <laughs> you read it so and much. you see so I, many parallels. And you know, today. I didn't need to, I didn't need to add anything. Um, I was, I was copy editing the book in um, April. I mean, sorry, when I say I'm copy editing, I mean, totally expert copy editor does the copy editing, but then I have to respond to every little thing. And I was so lucky that first of all, I, my copy editor is an emergency room doctor as well. And um, she just is equally zealous and scrupulous at both those jobs. So she was able to catch some of my medical errors. And then I also hired a midwife to read it. And she was at a home quarantined because of COVID exposure. So, you know, to get these two medical professionals in the middle of their very real medical work, finding the time to perfect my novel um, was such a help. And the only thing I remember changing to make it, not to make it more relevant to today, but I had avoided the word pandemic because even though it was technically a pandemic in 1918, uh, that word was not widely used. It seemed a bit exotic, like a sort of sociological term. So I talked about that, the plague or the epidemic. But by April 2020, everyone was using the word pandemic. <laughs> it had been sort of normalized overnight. So that's the only thing I remember changing. Um, everything else, I just decided, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be able to write something which is m more true to today by being as accurate as possible about 1918 and saying, how did it play out in those days? Because you get the perennially the same thing is happening and um, for instance uh, there's a sort of running motif in my book of um propaganda posters and um, you know the stupid things that governments say basically so there's um you know false reassurance uh there's um you know um unscientific suggestions you know people are told to eat an onion in a day back in 1918 like that'll keep you healthy or or keep a cheerful mindset you know because you know, giving in to despair will allow you to catch the flu and it'll benefit the Germans. So if you just keep a cheerful mindset, that'll keep the illness at bay. Uh, you get governments um, then and now blaming the poor for their own poverty, blaming the sick for their own sickness. So there was so much that I didn't need to in any way point up. It just sounded utterly like today, you know, which often made me feel very sad. Right. Were your uh, copy editors also kind of when COVID came around, like, whoa, <laughs> we <laughs> we kind of really hit this one on the nose. <laughs> pretty yeah, closely. yeah. And, you know, none of us, we, we, we absolutely stayed focused on being true to 1918. We, we never tried to sort of skew it to be relevant to today because it was just, it was all too relevant already. But what I've loved is, uh, first of all, my fan letters are usually from a kind of random assortment of people. But with the pull of the stars, they've nearly all been from either former or current healthcare workers. It's just amazing. I think they feel so seen. You know, sometimes older retired nurses will write to me and say, okay, it was 1965 in Newfoundland rather than 1918, but it was just like that. You know? right. 
And I think this year they've, they've had such a weird mixture of praise and adulation and hero worship and downright, you know, neglect, misunderstanding and blame as well. I mean, I think it's been a very strange year for them. It has, yeah. And actually, that's one of the things when we, we pick a book for Santa Monica Reads, we really, uh, you know, it's a book about something, but we also want these kind of multifaceted kind of themes that we can pull out uh, out of the side. And one of the programs we did early on was uh, we, we did a uh, online panel with two uh, medical professionals who were kind of telling us how it, it kind of resonates for them today as well. Um, one of the things that I, um, I, I know you, you kind of mentioned is um, you do a lot of um, historical fiction and you're very research oriented um, with um, most of your books kind of uh, and stories kind of being pulled from just a little historical an anecdote, like a little shred of information. And I think I, I saw an interview once with you where you actually don't want something where there's a lot of information about it. It's just a little, you want that little piece that kind of. Yeah, my, my perfect source is, you know, one paragraph, one painting, you know, so if I write about the truly obscure, you know, the, the racialized people put on show and freak shows and the poor women, queers, and those are usually ideal sources. And once I wrote about a quite famous people in a novel called Life Mask, and I was drowning under all the sources. And one of my characters, Horace Walpole, he left about 60 volumes of, of diaries, which have been published in letters. And I just thought like, ah, oh, there's not enough room for me to make it up. So it's kind of ideal when I have just, yeah, just, just enough to get me going. And you see, I'm a lapsed academic. I wanted to be a professor like my dad, um, who we lost this year, Dennis Dunner, who, who was a very famous prof and, and writer of literary criticism. And so I was planning to follow in his footsteps and I couldn't quite believe that I managed to sell two novels um, and, and, and sort of set out on the, on the path of being a full-time writer instead. So I love doing that element of original research um, and then putting on my writer's cap and getting to make it all up. So it's a funny thing. I often go looking for sources and then I'm going like, cool, didn't find it. I get to invent that bit. <laughs> It's a win-win um, because if I find the source, it's probably very interesting. And if I don't find the source, I'm like, ha ha, invention. Right. Have you um, ever considered like writing a narrative nonfiction work, um, you know, rather than a, a fictionalized version of, of some little kernel of information, you know, something like an Eric Larson type of book? Yeah, no, I think I just like those two satisfactions. I, I like those moments when my imagination gets to sort of store, but you know, what, in a way, using a sort of hang gliding motif, what, what gives it the, the, the great lift is um, the, the element of fact. And I like how fact forces you to be more quirky and original than you might be otherwise. And um, one of my novels, The Seal's Letter, is about a real Victorian divorce case. And if I had been inventing the story of a young woman who cheated on her older military husband, I'd probably have given her one lover, right? But this woman, Helen Coddington, she was carrying on with two different military colleagues of her husband's. And I just thought that was great. That's the kind of thing you wouldn't make up because mm -hmm. it's messy. It's real life. It's, you know, unromantic. So right. um, I love the, the way the facts will, will kind of salt my meat, as it were, you know. Um, and with the pull of the stars, I wasn't intending to use any real people because, as I was saying, you know, that the pandemic itself and the statistics and the you know, the, the details about people kind of drowning in their own liquids, that seemed enough fact to be dealing with. So I was intending to have three fictional characters. I knew I, I'd have a nurse midwife as my central character. And then I wanted to show the whole kind of ladder the, uh, of, 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 of healthcare workers. So I thought I'll go for one doctor and one sort of untrained volunteer because volunteers were really crucial in that, in that pandemic. And so many women found it an amazing kind of breakthrough moments to, to go and volunteer in hospitals and to feel useful for the first time in their lives. You know, a lot of these middle class women who were full of energy and drive and they'd been sitting at home with mummy all this time, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I'll invent a doctor, but I'll just do a bit of background reading in real Irish doctors at the time. And I come across this woman, Kathleen Lynn, who was as if tailor made for my book in that she was not only um, uh, I wanted a roaming doctor who wasn't attached to any one hospital because I wanted her to be an outsider in the hospital in my story. And um, so she was not only that, a roaming doctor, because no hospital had been willing to hire a woman full time as a doctor, but she was also a revolutionary on the run from police. She was also so committed to the cause of the, 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 the health of poor children that she was about to found a children's hospital for them. 
Uh, she was also living with a woman who founded her flu clinic. She was doing research into flu vaccines. I mean, I couldn't have made her up. She was irresistible. So she insisted on becoming part of my novel. I tried to fictionalize her and give her a different name. And by the second draft, she was like striding towards the spotlight. You know. Ah, okay. Um, I actually had a question about that. Where you know, was, did you did you plan on doing something more fictional and then she just sort of inserted herself in but you know, yeah she really yeah. did um you know i love how unpredictable the research process is because people often assume that research is done in some very sort of pragmatic sensible way like you know that maybe you could hire somebody to go research you know hospital practices for you but no i could never hire someone because i don't know what i want to find until i find it and quite often the things you discover that you might think would be just background research or, or tiny details they actually produce plot points they produce um long story elements um tiny tiny little facts uh will will often make me go back to the the story, even if I've planned the story already, and add new elements because of the the minutiae of what I discover, and and sometimes entire characters like Kathleen Lynn will insist on on being included. So even though I'm a big planner, I love the way books are slippery. They get away from your control. You know, if you're if you're always listening out for what'll make the book better, then you'll be willing to to throw half your plans away because uh, someone like Kathleen Lynn will sort of stride forward and say, "Me, I'm better than anything you could invent." Mm -hmm. Um, before I continue, I actually realized I forgot at the beginning to tell uh, those of you who are watching um, that if you do have questions, please send them to the moderator. Unfortunately, uh, we have an event chat where usually you could talk to each other, but uh, <laughs> my colleagues and I couldn't figure out how to enable that button. So, um, so if you do have questions, yeah, you can. Honestly, send they wanted to reassure you all. They're not trying to stop you from talking like a <laughs> teacher. <laughs> right. So, so please do uh, share questions if you have questions, um, and we'll we'll ask those. Uh, Get through mine. Um, so back to um, your research um, kind of uh, drive, and you're very, very research oriented. Has COVID kind of hamstrung your ability to research whatever's you know you're working on next? Because I know we, we've had travel limitations and we've had. <laughs> yeah, I would say and... I would say barely because, like like many authors, you know, the internet has really set me free. Even 20 years ago, um, you know, historical fiction, uh, often there'd be a note saying something like, my beloved husband who drove me around France to all those little archives. And you realize that the research process was long, elaborate and in person. And now, really, the Internet allows you to go on these deep dives into anything, often drawing on the expertise of, of those who have chosen to share it. I mean, I'm so grateful collectively to 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 all those obsessive men who do like one wikipedia entry each like they know everything about you know the the here's one i've drawn on for a past book the the different uniforms of Aer Lingus flight attendants on the irish airline like there's, there's this one guy out there who has pictures of them all and i needed to know what they were wearing in different eras and he was sharing that for free on the internet so the internet is an amazing kind of crowdsourced investigation of the past um, so, okay, one way in which um, COVID affected me was this, the, there was a book I could only find at the British Library in London, big London, not London, Ontario, where I live. And I would usually get to go look that up on one of my trips and I was thwarted. So I hired somebody, um, um, but that's one of the only examples I can think of. Um, I tracked down books on, on you know, uh, secondhand book websites sometimes. Um, or get libraries to, you know, borrow them from other libraries. Um, you have to be, you know, you have to put some effort into it. But, but no, I haven't found COVID stopped me researching or writing. I mean, COVID writing is a fairly COVID-friendly career in that I was used to being at home making stuff up anyway. So COVID wasn't quite as much of a shock to me in terms of daily life um, as it has been to many other people. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm a daily public librarian, but I'm a I'm an archivist by training. So you probably have a lot of archivists out there who are loving the opportunity to do do a little bit of research on their behalf. <laughs> um, so um, we kind of talked about Kathleen Lynn a little bit, but um, I wanted to talk about um, Julia and and definitely Bridey, um, who are kind of um, they're they're quieter characters, and they don't really. Politics is not really um, the political kind of things that surrounded them are really not a part of their central motivation, but it is a part of their lives. And so I'm wondering, um, can you talk about um, how you use um, your characters to kind of pull in some of these kind of political 
moments of, of whatever time frame you're talking about or in, in every no, hour? That, that's a great question, Robert. Nobody's asked. I love this that, you know, uh, after a year on, you know, smart interviewers are still thinking of questions nobody's thought to ask before. And um, the question of how much and how to include politics, it, it really changed for me between two different drafts because, you know, I came to this book thinking, okay, the kind of the Irish revolutionary period, you know, in Ireland, we're obsessed with it. My partner complains that every time I take her to a play in Dublin, it'll be something set between 1916 and 1926. You know, or that is our founding era in which we, you know, basically broke away from Britain. And, and you know, my, my grandparents' generation would have gone from like circa 1916, they would have been cheering on Britain in the war, you know, um, and 10 years later, they were a separate country. So it was an astonishing change in, in most people's political allegiances. So I was really aware that it's like, it's a bit like an American writing about the Civil War or a Jewish writer writing about the Holocaust. It's like, it's the big subject. So I was really wary of getting into the Irish revolutionary politics. I felt like it was that big looming compulsory subject. So I thought, no, I'm, I'm really writing a novel about women's lives which often don't fit the same kind of political categories. So I'm going to write about these these women giving birth and other women helping them in this tiny little ward. I'm keen, going to keep it very micro. And I knew, of course, politics would still come up, but I, I, I didn't think I was going to address the, the Irish political background much at all. And then Kathleen Lynn marches in and starts talking eloquently to Julia about how, you know, the fact that these babies are dying of malnutrition at a rate higher than the soldiers in the trenches. And, um, you know, that is political. So um, I really tried to keep Julia sort of at, at one remove from that, just very, very focused on doing her job. And I remember my my um, my American literary agent, Kathy, Kathy Anderson, she said to me, what she said was, in, in the age of Trump, you either have to write a novel which is pure fluff or a novel which takes account of politics because people either want a complete escape or they want something that addresses the, the big questions of their time. You can't be half-hearted about politics. So she said, I think Julia would have opinions and she, she can't keep her distance. So yeah. I rewrote the scene and I have Julia say, oh, I'm, I'm too busy for politics, no time for politics. And then Kathleen Lynn says to her, everything's politics. Um, and I, I really thought that that made the novel stronger, that it's, it's not that Julia suddenly goes and joins the revolution, but she begins to see that a moment like a pandemic is, is this really bright light exposing and the underlying decisions that have been made about basically who gets the food, who gets the services, who gets the access. So, you know, when I would see a, an Irish propaganda poster saying things like, you know, um, keep clean and ven well ventilated and well warmed. And then I would look at photographs of this damp, hideous, moldy buildings in which families were living, you know, two family to a room in old houses. And I would think, you know, how dare a government tell its citizens to keep clean and well ventilated and warm when they're living in slum conditions. So in a way, I got more political writing this novel and I, I allowed Julia to start, even in the middle of her busy, busy days, to start those, to ask those big questions. And it doesn't come to any simple answers, but in a way, the most, the most political, the beginning of any political education is just to start asking the big questions. Right. That's that's kind of one of the things that I kind of liked about the novel the most, which when we were making this, uh, our selections was kind of the quiet ways those those threads came into the story. It, you don't bang people over the head with it. it. It's, you know, it's just a part of their lives. Um, and I, I think it's I, it's interesting how you have Kathleen Lynn and then you have Julia and then you have Bridie, who's just kind of this. I don't know. She's just like a little bright light going through. Like she's not aware of any of that stuff. It's just how can I help? And yet her her life, you know, to make any sense of it, you have to see it in terms of politics and and the Irish state, which really, uh, sorry, in, in this the novelist said just before the Irish state is formed, but the Irish state inherited this whole network of um, British welfare institutions, and because it had all these monks and priests and nuns to run it, um, you know, the Irish state ended up locking up a huge percentage of its citizens, not any one particular ethnic group. Say in Canada, where I live, we have this awful shame of our residential schools where, where indigenous people were basically imprisoned. In Ireland, it wasn't any one ethnic group. It was just you know the poor, the undesirables. Um, so everything from mother and baby homes to Magdalen hospitals to um, uh, orphanages, reformatories, so-called training schools, 
Um, so I, Bridie is the only character I've ever written based on a government investigation in that the Irish state has been, you know, gradually um, coming to terms with its hideous history. Um, and one of one of the big reports, the Ryan report, was a report on abuses in um, uh, residential institutions like, say, orphanages. And I read that report cover to cover to find Bridie in it. And I was not looking for the worst bits at all. I left out all the kind of Sadian scenes of tortures and rapes and so on. I was just looking for those tiny little details of kids not fed enough. And so they might, you know, steal some milk from the baby's bottle of a child they were looking after. So tiny, heartbreaking moments um, about how you might survive in a system like that. Or or even what I found most heartbreaking was that the, some of these uh, survivors would remember moments when someone was kind to them. And those stood out, you know, someone reminisced about a cook who left an entire boiled egg on top of the, the sort of compost tub that the kid was bringing out to the pigs, you know, like as a gift, here's a whole egg. And, you know, if you're grateful for a whole egg, it means nobody's ever given you anything. So, again, I tried to kind of find the politics in the tiny little details rather than adopting a more kind of broad brush approach. You know, but yeah, considering Bridie comes out of a government report, I really, I'm very fond of her as a character because she still has a lot of, a lot of life to her. Yeah, a lot of spark. Um, one of the other things that I, I really like about um, um, the novels of yours that I've read is you have a really um, great way of embodying the voice of whoever story you're telling, and they're they're kind of very widely varied um, voices. You know, from uh, from uh, the the boy in um, room, like how do you, how do you, is it difficult for you to occupy that that space um, to tell that story, especially like in room? With I mean, it's, it's a five year old boy. Um, uh, I, I would say, um, you know, the question I spend most time on before writing a novel is point of view, because mm -hmm. it'll be such a different novel. You know, room would have been a very conventional crime novel if I told it from the point of view of the girl in peril. You know. Um, choosing to tell it from the point of view of the child who had no idea why he was growing up in a locked room or even that it was a locked room, that was the originality of the book. So, you know, you know, rather than just thinking about content, I very quickly start to ask myself about point of view, who will tell the story and from what vantage point, like how immediately are, you know, Jack is telling it moment after moment as he lives it, whereas others might choose to look back and tell you in memory. And then I think a lot about third person versus first person. Like, should this be a first person voice or should this be third person? And basically, first person is the eye. It's very hard to pull off unless unless you're really very comfortable with it and you can just hear the person chatting in your head. So in the case of Jack, it was very easy because I followed my four year old son around and I analyzed his language like a, an ant like an, an anthropologist, you know, I'd write down all his errors and I'd figure out which ones were not too confusing to the reader, you know, because I didn't want to put the reader off, but still very flavorsome and which ones captured the kind of four or five year old mindset. I love when they try and make verbs logical, for instance, they'll they'll like put ED on the end of something to make it a past tense because that's how it should logically be, but isn't. Um, so so, yeah, with Jack or or I thought Julia, I could probably channel very easily, given that she was Irish and her, her English is not that different from mine. Whereas my next novel is set in the sixth century and the English I'm writing is kind of representing um, people who would have been speaking in Irish. So in, in every way, it's, 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 it's less immediately vernacular. So in that case, I'll go for what they call close third person, where you're, you're, you're still very much adopting the perspective of one character at a time, but you're kind of perched on their shoulder like a bird, you know? So um, yeah, I think a lot about voice. And even if something is third person, you can still make it very flavorsome. It can really capture the thinking of the person. So often readers will remember it as if it was first person. Readers don't always remember are they reading I or she or they. Um, so long as you're, you know, so close to that character that you you see things as they see them and and you you think things in the order they think them. So in the case of Julia, for instance, I I tried to make you all feel like nurses. You know, I tried to adopt. Uh, I used long, long chapters, for instance, so that it would feel like one endless shift, you know, and I wanted you literally to get, you know, a bit overworked, a bit tired, and every now and then to think like, oh, what have I forgotten? 
So, you know, I, I would keep little lists of, of the, the duties of a nurse. And um, every now and then, you know, Julia would be caught up in a conversation. And I would suddenly think, oh, my God, nobody's had a bedpan in hours. You know, when's the last time they had anything to eat? So I was in every case, I'm always trying to adapt the style of the novel to the particular story I'm telling. So, yeah, in, in this case, long chapters. Um, another thing I'm often asked about is um, uh, I didn't use quotation marks for the dialogue in this one. That's the first for me. But I really felt it was necessary. It was it was a really helpful choice to get that slightly, you know, trippy, tired, blurry feeling of like things are coming at Julia from all directions. You know, she's hearing snatches of song. She's having thoughts. She's remembering things. Patients are saying things. Um, uh, fellow nurses are saying things and, and all these things come at her equally um, like like fish. Um, things are not neatly categorized in her head because she's having such a busy shift. And similarly, she can't have a conversation just with one of her patients because the others all have needs too. So, so you know, that's not a permanent style choice. That's just what this particular novel needed. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of choices um, that um, you you make, you like you said, uh, about two thirds of your work is historical fiction. Is there is there a discomfort in working in, in more contemporary? Because um, um, I know I, I think you mentioned um, the Fritzl story kind of making that hard to t tell a, a story about real people, um, you know. Well, well, put it this way, when I write um, my modern stories, I don't tend to have them be based on real people. Yeah, like I'm, I'm very comfortable writing about Kathleen Lynn in 1918. You know, she's long dead. There are no children around to freak me out by saying, what are you saying about our mother? <laughs> um, whereas, yes, if I'm writing about today, I usually don't write about real people because it would feel very intrusive. Now, I often am using some storyline from my own life or with those of my friends, but if it's from a friend, I ask permission. And if it's from my own life, I, I, I rework it a lot. For instance, I wrote one novel about moving to Canada, but I made it a flight attendant doing it instead of an author. So very different, very different um, perspective. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say I'm uncomfortable with, with writing contemporary stories. It's just the ones that occur to me that kind of tease me have tended to be roughly two out of three of them have tended to be historical. But one thing I love about writing contemporary fiction is so much easier to be funny. Um, for instance, I've got yeah my two books for young readers. The lotteries are set right now. And, you know, anything I read or come across or, you know, my kids get off the school bus and tell me about something, you know, that that could go straight into the lotteries books. I love that sort of shared cultural reference that we've all got. You know, you can just throw in some 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 familiar funny moment or or something from the internet and um there's a feeling of like oh everybody will get it um, and i love that kind of low-key humor and i love introducing relatively difficult subjects but through a lot of humor so say in the lotteries one of the kids has shaken baby syndrome he's a lot of developmental delay because somebody shook him and and to me i loved the challenge of including a, a kid in a family and having everyone be just like this is how he is we adore him and it not being a big, heavy subject and be using humor um, uh, among the characters as well as a humorous narrative voice is a great way to kind of, you know, take the sting out of some subject that people are afraid of. I suppose because when I started writing, you know, I was I was writing about, you know, same sex love in the early 1990s in Ireland. <laughs> so it felt like I needed a lot of humor as part of my diplomacy, you know, and it kind of comes naturally anyway. I'm somebody who laughs a lot. Um, but yeah, no, I absolutely love working in, in contemporary uh, mm -hmm. fiction. I love the way I can sort of throw in, you know, everything I come across or, or experience. Um, it's, it's a great kind of, you know, almost uh, scooping up of material for my daily life. And I really enjoy that. Whereas my historical ones can sometimes feel a bit like, oh, here's another grim, dark story you have to tell, Emma. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, um... Let's. Uh, we've been going for about a half an hour now, and I, I did want to turn to some of the um, audience questions. Yeah, there yeah. Are audience questions, but for that, the, uh, yeah. um, I have some co-moderators here, and I for some reason I can't see the questions. I'm wondering if they you can. You know, see I'm the looking questions. at the Q and A, and I'm seeing oh. a question from Meredith Luria. Oh. What is Heidi's motivation to pretend she's had the flu already? That is an excellent one. Again, nobody's ever asked me that, Meredith. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I would say 
Okay, Bridey was inspired by a real volunteer. There's there's a book on the on the flu in America by Nancy Bristow, is it? Um, American Pandemic, it's called. And in those pages, I came across one particular volunteer who came to work at the hospital and um, caught the flu and died all in a week. You might say, oh, terrible. She must have wished she'd never done that. But no, on her deathbed, this volunteer said, this has been the best week of my life. And I was just, that would be an example of one of the tiny things you come across in the research, which suddenly, you know, you were just going looking for details, but what you found in the entire storyline there. So I thought, okay, how could that possibly be true? How could it be that exciting to volunteer at a hospital? And I thought, well, there are various ways that could be true. If you were very, you know, comfortably bored and middle class, it could be exciting to suddenly be up to your arms in bandages and blood. But equally, if you were someone who had always been treated as lowest of the low, um, for, you know, if, for instance, if you'd grown up in the in the in the Irish sort of pipeline of residential institutions, one of the things the survivors talked about a lot was being made to feel worthless. You know, being told, oh, you know, we spend all this money looking after you. You owe us. You have to pay us back because you are worthless. And and the paradox is that the kids in these organizations, they were worked so hard. For instance, industrial praying, they would have to, you know, pray en masse. Um, to, you know, novenas and so on to earn money for the religious order. So, you know, everything about them, even their prayers was 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 rented out. Um, so I thought somebody like Bridie could actually find even volunteer work in a hospital hugely engrossing and meaningful. And so I liked the idea that, you know, when 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 asked about whether she'd had the flu or not, Bridie would be inclined not as a cold blooded lie, but she just she wouldn't want there to be any obstacle. You know, she'd want she'd want to help. She'd want to stay. And so she'd say like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've had it. Um, so so she's just so enthusiastic about doing meaningful work, even though it's not paid, even though it's not hugely high status. But um, I think perhaps because, you know, the history of women has so often included women not having their capacities fully used or women being kept at home rather than out in the world. Perhaps that inclines me to maybe slightly romanticized work even that like if you found meaningful work, it would just be like the best thing, you know? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, Bridie's whole storyline came out of that question of whether your world could be transformed by a few days of meaningful work, even as your body is being transformed by a virus without you even knowing it. You know, could I, could I do all that in three days was a big challenge basically that I asked myself. So thank you, um, Mary. Actually, Great you mentioned the three days. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the, that's another thing that um, we kind of really liked about the, the novel was um, the, the really compact, um, the, that it took place over a short amount of time and it made it more thrilling. And I noticed that's actually, that happens a lot in, in, in your work you, where you, you really kind of- I condense. love limits, it's true. Um, you know, I, I started writing plays even before novels. And in plays, you know, the, the more you can confine the action, you know, the, the traditional uh, unities of time, space and action, it'll it'll just make a more pricklingly exciting play if you can, you know, shut the people in the elevator or keep them waiting at a bus stop or, you know, give them just one tree like in Waiting for Godot. So even with, though a novel is, is a naturally more kind of expansive medium, I still love those, those walls because um, it's like, that concept of Brownian motion, I remember learning at school, you know, like the, the, the atoms literally bang off the sides of the box and the temperature goes up and the, the, the pressure goes up. And so if you confine people together, um, first of all, it's a great way to show their relationship happening very fast. Again, I thought, could, could people fall in love in three days? You know, if you, if you shut them together, obviously they can annoy each other, but they could also um, be fascinated by each other and change each other's lives. And I wanted both um, I wanted Dr. Lynn to change Julia's life and Julia to change Bridie's life and Bridie to change Julia's life. And, you know, confining them in, the, in this kind of human petri dish was a great way to do that. Um, and Three Days also has a lovely kind of ring of, you know, Jesus dying and coming back again or in fairy tales. It just seemed a wonderfully uh, concentrated um, length of time. And also it was just enough time to show childbirth and all its ups and downs because some childbirths are really quick, scarily quick, and some of them can last a week, you know, uh, and I certainly knew a few women who'd, who'd labored for two or three days. So I thought, yeah, two or three days would, would allow me to do a good kind of 
splice of the different experiences of childbirth and and how how weird the how weird the sort of timing of it can be you know um you know you might think better out than in as quickly as possible but actually really fast births can be scary so so yeah three days was just an ideal time frame for me excellent uh now i've, I've figured out where the questions are so we have rebecca asking uh what part of your writing or imagination or life experience helped with your birth scenes well in a word rebecca my placenta features in the novel <laughs> i've never said that before and um, i uh, so 17 years ago, uh, our, our son was born. I've given birth to our two kids and um, found the experience, you know, fascinating and wonderful. And and when our son was born, you know, um, um, it was all great, you know, not even that painful. Everything was fine. And then I noticed the doctor ran in and there was suddenly an air of crisis. And, and afterwards, I was like, whoa, what was that? And I realized that, you know, quite a common problem. The placenta wouldn't come out. And so the doctor had basically come in and, you know, solved the problem with her bare hands. And so I always thought I, I owe her something. So really, um, in this novel, I thought I will use that experience, but from the, I'll be the binge wife this time. I'll be the one trying to save a woman with this problem in 1918 with her bare hands, with a lot less medical expertise. Um, and, um, and it was absolutely fascinating writing something autobiographical but set a hundred years ago and from the point of view of the other person, you know, <laughs> and, and so in a way, this novel is my kind of homage to like the midwives and the doctor there, because, of course, you know, for me, it wasn't a big crisis because I was in Canada with free health care in 2003. <laughs> it was no problem. But if I had been in, you know, the 18th century, I'd have died if I had been, in, you know, there are parts of rural Uganda where women labor for days and can't get to a clinic. I could have died there. So either far away in space or in time, that's the moment I would have died. And and I have this weird feeling of like, oh, so all my time from now on is 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 luxury, is privilege. I really felt my privilege basically that day. So mm -hmm. um so yeah, that that features in the novel. And <laughs> so do the birth experiences of some friends of mine. Um I know somebody who who had to get a transfusion during childbirth and she, you know, they didn't have her blood her kind and so they used the so-called universal blood which is not universal for everybody she had a dreadful reaction to it almost died so um yeah this, this book is kind of a sampler of um birth crises of people i know birth is so interesting people should write about it more often um so uh going back to the bottom of our questions we have art who asked um is it modern times that prevent learning or is it some indictment of human nature Oh, question. that's a big question. Hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm probably not managing to answer such a big question, but but I will say something that answers a part of it. And um, people have, have, have asked me a lot, and um, you know, what was different about reactions to a pandemic back then? And I would say there was less denial. I mean, you occasionally come across it, um, you know, somebody referring to, you know, this so-called flu epidemic. Um, but that was just the, the, the occasional casual remark. There were not big movements or campaigns to deny that it was happening or calling it a hoax, for instance. Um, I think social media perhaps has not invented certain aspects of human stupidity, but has certainly allowed them to thrive. Um, it's literally allowed them to network with each other and created a kind of culture of, ooh, I know better than my neighbors. I know what you don't know about COVID. Um, so I'm, I'm really not seeing any of that back in 1918. So it was much harder for accurate knowledge to to be discovered and shared back then. But there was certainly a lot less active disinformation. There were no Russian bots. There were no you know trolls deliberately spreading lies. So um, in some ways, I have to draw the conclusion that we have collectively grown stupider. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, you probably have already answered this one, but Bettina um, asked, why didn't you use quotation marks? Did you ever use them at one point, like maybe in an earlier draft? Or No, it's not that I did it in a draft, but I, I sweated over the decision because I'm well aware that, that some people um, find it so difficult to read a dialogue that doesn't have quotation marks. And, and some people are so irritated by it, in, not just in, in my book, but say in the works of people like Cormac McCarthy, that they, they would just shut a book immediately. So I knew there was a danger I would lose some readers or that others readers would find it hard to follow. And some people have written to me and said, why don't you use any punctuation? And I think, whoa, I just did one kind of punctuation mark I didn't use. And some people are experiencing that as a kind <laughs> of a, you know, death of all punctuation. Um, I, 
I just felt this book, I felt stylistically it would give me what I wanted, this kind of blur. I mean, in a way, the book is full of very precise details about, you know, things like placentas. Um, but I also wanted it to feel atmospheric and to capture the kind of exhausting, bewildering atmosphere of, of these long shifts in which your attention is pulled five different ways and you're, you're desperately trying to um, triage all the time, you know, work out who needs you most at any one moment or, you know, whether you prioritize cleaning up vomit from the floor or checking somebody's, uh, you know, labor stage. Um, so I, I just I had a feeling that the the kind of, you know, slightly extra work a reader needs to do to understand who's speaking when, that that it would work for this particular novel. Um, and um, I noticed se several of the publishers who are translating this book have written to me to ask permission, like sort of, in French, can we please use, you know, our equivalent of quotation mark? And in Portuguese, can we please? So I, I know it is difficult for some readers. Um, I just stylistically, there's something in the work of those who do it very well, the, the no quote marks, like say Roddy Doyle and Ali Smith. Um, it, it can create a wonderful kind of seepage in that the, the dialogue is not just kind of neatly contained away from the narration. It's as if thoughts and words spoken and even words sung all exist in a great kind of soup of words. Um, so, so that's what I was going for with this one. Um, but, you know, I'm right back to quotation marks for the next book. So I really try not to have a house style. I really try and always ask myself, what does this book need? Like, does this book need my next book, the, the early medieval one, it's really short. I felt it absolutely needed economy and shortness, whereas my book set in the late 18th century about rich people became very long and lavish. So I'm always trying to serve the particular needs of this this book, this story. Um, so Nina asks, um, did you consider alternate endings to the book? And what was your process of writing the end? Yeah, I never considered alternate endings because because I suppose I I I imagined Bridie from the start in terms of her last three days. Um, I, I I'm a big planner, and I I've often been inspired by facts. Say my my novel Slammer can um, ends with an execution and. It was always inspired by that particular historical incident. So it's not like I was just writing a story and saying, "Oh, which way might this go?" I was always writing towards that point, like a, like the vanishing point in a in a very strict drawing. You know, the kind of drawings kids have to do at school, showing those lines of perspective. You know, I, I love when all the elements converge in something which may be highly painful and distressing, but which feels true in some way because because the pattern is complete. And, and writing is, is often so much a matter of, of dropping in tiny little, not just hints, but patterns of imagery, say, which lead you towards this point of like, oh, that's how it had to end. I mean, it, it's so sad, but that feels somehow artistically right. Um, so, so yeah, I had planned the novel from the very beginning to lead towards the point where it got to. Um, and um, I, I think with my very first novels, um, Stir Fry, I ended up changing the ending, but that's because I was I was young and not really in control of my material. I was kind of blundering. Ever since I've, I've planned them, then I tend to there are, there are other things I may change or vary, um, like say letting Kathleen Lynn into this book. But the ending is not usually something I change because it's it's so important to me to yeah to reach that vanishing point. You know. All right. Um, Patricia asks, uh, was there a reason you divided the book into the four stages of the flu? So I, I mentioned the colors. The... Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're doing research, you're always aware you have like this, you know, giant uncontrollable kind of mound of material. And the last thing you want to do is just sort of plonk it down in front of the reader. So you're always looking for ways to make it clearer and for ways that feel like um, that feel literary rather than just analytical. So, you know, rather than have the doctor say, give a speech in which you sort of analyze the, the typical course of the flu, I was looking for a way of doing that in say, you know, sort of imagery. So when I came across the, the color thing, the, the fact that um, some people got cyanosis and in the case of uh, very pale people, such as most of the Irish have been, um, it, it showed up very dramatically as, as this darkening color and very particular purples on particular bits of your face. 
And I thought, okay, that's like some kind of, you know, um, I mean, all year in different countries, we've been using color coded systems for like, oh, we're at red level, we're at orange, we're at green, we're working towards yellow. Um, or, you know, threat, threat um, color levels in American airports and so on. So I thought it would be fascinating if the body's um, color changes could, for a nurse, um, operate as that kind of, you know, warning system. Um, you know, the idea that the human body becomes this kind of readable statement of danger. I thought that was that was a lovely example of um, making making knowledge concrete rather than abstract. Um, so I'm very often looking for looking for things like that and where it'll be, you know, more more like a poem than uh, than a government document or an essay, you know. Um, and as I say, I wanted long, long chapters so that you'd feel, you know, utterly caught up in a tiring shift. Um, and I wanted I wanted the, the stages to be leading towards death, but us not to realize until we got there what we were going towards. So instead of calling it something like, you know, you know, like, well, ill, dying, dead, you know, that's too obvious at a glance. I thought the colors would seem just like kind of abstract uh, colors until you realized what they were converging on, you know. Um, I suppose the goal is always, even if readers are distressed by something, you want them, you want it to feel like, you know, like, like say the, a rhyme in a good song. Um, you know, you want it to feel sort of inevitable and right. And you won't always get it right and readers won't always agree with you. You know, I've had I've readers outraged with me or I've had reviewers saying, love the book, but outraged by the end. But if, when that happens, it's so nice because it's like they care so much about these people I have made up out of words that they're willing to fight me about what they think would have really happened. And that's, that's superb. Um, that that feeling of like you know all of us together believing in these made up people. So I I don't mind if anyone wants to uh, you know fight me about how I've treated <laughs> my characters because I'm like oh this is amazing you believe in the characters. Love it. Um, Beverly asks when did it occur to you to launch a same sex relationship between Julia and Bridie and how did that contribute to the themes of the? I'm trying to remember that, yeah, because like it wasn't my original thought. I wasn't like, oh, I will set a love story in a in a maternity ward. It's more that once I brought these characters together, I was suddenly aware of their capacity to change each other's lives. And one of the fastest ways that people can change each other's lives is by falling in love. And I like the fact that there's kind of a a, a prickle between Julia and um, Dr. Lynn as well, and um, that they're you know I didn't want it to be just two people. I didn't didn't want it to be that cozy. Um, I, you know, I, I, I like writing about love, but I like it to take you by surprise. I don't like it to feel like, you know, an obviously sort of set up romance. So I, I like the structure of having these three women who are so important and they all affect each other's lives in different ways. Um, so I don't remember, but it would have been quite early on in the planning process. I do a huge amount of planning and, you know, this sounds, you know, like I'm, I'm a bureaucrat, but it's more like I do a huge amount of daydreaming and mulling it over. Um, I often think of my novels years and years before I write them. And in the pull of the stars, it all happened relatively fast, but still I would have had quite a few months of like, okay, if I, if I set my novel, say an early decision was that I would go for a maternity ward because I came across again, this tiny little obscure fact, which was that um, some of the, the people most vulnerable to catching the flu and having terrible side effects were women in late pregnancy or just after birth. So that made me think, okay, I'll go for a maternity ward. And then who's gonna run the maternity ward? So this gives me Julia and then, uh, when I was trying to work out how you would make a bed, like change the bed of, of a patient, and I realized you need two people. You actually can't follow the procedures, you know, rolling them and changing the sheets and so on without two people. So that, in a way, that task gave me bridey because I thought Julia needs somebody to make the bed with her. Who's that? And then I knew I had to have a doctor because, you know, a nurse's job was defined by all the things she couldn't do. She wasn't allowed to prescribe or diagnose um, she was really constantly kowtowing to a doctor. So I thought, who's this doctor? So in a way, the, the actual realities of the job produced my three characters. And, and then I suppose fairly soon after that, I would have, I would have thought of love blooming between them. And, um, you know, we're always afraid to write about love in a sappy way. And there's nothing like death for, uh, you know, taking some of the sugar out of the drink, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I love the idea that I could set up a situation which was so grueling that I could allow a very beautiful and spontaneous love to develop in it without it getting too sweet or sappy because I, I knew that death was always hovering. 
And so, you know, that gave me a lovely kind of darkness to set the brightness against in literary terms. So I'm aware, you know, this makes my readers suffer. You know, being a novelist is, is quite a strange job in that some of your, some of the ways in which you're treating your readers are, you know, cruel. I am very aware of that. You treat your characters cruelly and you treat your readers cruelly, you know? Right. Yeah, I do worry about the ethics of that sometimes. <laughs> Why do I get a kick out of making people cry? Uh, well, honestly, oh, uh, about Tim, good old. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll, let me get. Uh, I do have a quick question about uh, Julia and Bridie still. Um, sure. Follow up on that. One. Um, one of the things that we really liked about the book when we picked the book was that there was, through all of the bleak storyline, there was still this like tinge of hopefulness at the end, and I think that just kind of that discovery that it, in Julia, you know, in herself was. Well, that was that was just like a beautiful kind of it was like she finally blossomed or there was a bloom where she suddenly oh okay you know she emerged from this awful you know crumbling earth you know anyway that that was what, what i took from that um that kind of ending there no you're right uh, and and it's funny novelists sometimes get you know readers sometimes criticize them saying how could you kill that character off that's not fair to them they're wonderful i'm thinking I know that's why I gave them a good death because when we want to be nice to our characters, we basically give them page, we give them page time, we give them more room to speak, we give them a more memorable um, scene. And um, so, so you know, killing our characters off is not a sign that we're in any way judging against them or or being mean to them or not seeing their value. Um, in a way. For us, our novels are never finished, right? They're always in the, on this sort of eternal loop every time someone reads them. In a way, it's like a video game. You know, Bridie comes to life every time somebody opens that book. So giving her giving her a, a, a death that feels right, giving her a beautiful death, is it's like uh, giving someone a great role on stage, you know, and then and they get to replay it every night. Um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, and that's why I'm, I, early on, I decided to, to have some moment where, um, uh, somebody would hear that bit of Wagner playing, you know, the whole idea of, of love death as a as a single beautiful artistic moment. Um, that's that's the kind of vibe I was trying to go for. And then we have Daniel's question. I love the character of Tim and his quiet domesticity, a kind of role reversal with Julia, who is out working as a professional, was playing with gender roles here deliberate. Yeah, I mean, this, this, I was out of a practical question. I was thinking like, okay, where does this nurse live? Obviously, she could live in a dormitory with 20 other nurses, but I don't really want to introduce 20 more characters when she goes home to sleep. And um, so I looked up the census to see where nurses lived. And I found a couple of them lived with their brothers. And I thought, oh, that'd be a good situation where she's, you know, a spinster, not married and not having children. I wanted this contrast between the women having the babies and then the, the, the non-mothers who are helping them have the babies almost like kind of a, a priestess cast of, of, you know, childless women helping the babies into the world. And um, I thought that would really undermine the kind of, you know, distinction between, you know, women who have babies and women who don't, if I sort of brought them all together on the ward. But anyway, I was thinking, okay, so she lives with her brother. What's the story there? And I, I knew that the war was going on in the background and then I wanted to show it as real, but without spending many pages on it. Um, so I thought, well, if he's back from the war and if he's damaged, that would be a lovely way of suggesting the war without going into great detail. And I decided to make him be, you know, traumatically mute after the war. And that, strangely enough, put him in an oddly wifely position and that he's not able to go out in the world and do public jobs. And he's very shy and afraid of people. But he's, you know, many of the activities that these men were recommended to do um, were highly therapeutic ones like um, gardening and cooking and so on. And, and sort of homemaking. And so I thought actually Julie is ending up with a kind of a wife figure, um, which is really interesting considering we tend to think of, of the war in often very conventional terms of like the men went off to war and the women scrimped and sewed and cooked at home. Um, so so yeah, a very interesting role reversal there. Um, and even the fact that they're brother and sister rather than a married couple, it, it, was a, it was a different way of writing about a kind of domestic pairing. And of course, you know, the, the idea of the baby at the end is going to is going to further emphasize the kind of, you know, oddity of their family and what each of them brings to the mix. Um, Tim is the only character I've, I've written who who doesn't speak. And I really enjoyed the challenge of of writing him as clearly very, you know, 
attentive in these conversations and very caring about Julia and lots to say. And there are things he like he doesn't he doesn't want to talk about being beaten up and he does want to talk about um you know Julia's birthday say and he needs to do all this without dialogue. So it was a it was a very interesting challenge, you know. Um I think I think writers are often seen as feminist if they write about women, but actually I think the way we write about men is just as important. So I'm I'm very interested in writing about sort of non-traditional men, you know. Um, right at the last minute here, Susan has popped in a question. Where can we find copies of your plays to read? Oh, I have a collection of my plays um, published. Uh, not sure where they're distributed in America, but you can find them online. Emmadon has selected plays. And then the Room play um, is uh, is published as a separate standalone. Um, so thank you. Not, not often asked that. Um, the premiere, the 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 room play, which I did with an amazing uh, Scottish director who added songs to it. You wouldn't expect this, and it's not a it's not like a musical. There's no dancing and no jazz hands, but um, it's got songs added to it as a way, as a kind of private uh, release valve for for Mal, the things that she can't tell Jack. So anyway, um, we put that on in Britain and Ireland, and we were bringing it to North America, but its premiere got cancelled last March 2020. Um, got cancelled on opening night uh, due to COVID. So um, I'm looking very much forward to uh, that finally reaching North America. In, uh, it's reaching Toronto in um, January, it's coming up. So so yeah, I, I don't do theatre very often, but when I do, I always remember this is the most fun ever. I should do this all the time. All right. Um, so um, we, we've just hit the, the hour mark, and um, looks like uh, we, we've had some great questions. Um, uh, for those of you watching us, um, my colleague uh, Jennifer is going to share a survey, I believe, somehow, either a link or it will get emailed to you or I'm not sure how, um, look in the chat. Um, but the one question I usually always like to ask authors um, with with these talks um, is for, the, like I said, you're, you're the 19th year of Santa Monica Reads, um, and we, we've really prided ourselves on really picking something different every year. Um, but really the point of Santa Monica Reads is building community through a love of reading and sharing a love of reading. So um, passing it forward, is there anything you recommend that um, just loved recently or is, you know, just a all-time classic that you think everyone should um, read? <laughs> Ooh, any... Okay, this is not a very original choice because it's won so many prizes this year, but Maggie O'Farrell's novel, Hamnet, is just beautiful because you think it's a kind of a tied to Shakespeare novel and that is about his family back home. And then you realize it's a novel about a mother and her children in a time of plague. And it's just the most beautiful and moving piece of fiction. So yeah, I'd heartily recommend Hamnet. Um, well, um, I think that's 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 all for us. I mean, it's almost bedtime for you probably. So, um, so thank you so much for joining us, Emma. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody um, who's been watching us. Um, thank you for book discussions and coming to our special programs. Um, we'll see you again next year, um, which will be our 20th anniversary. So we will pick something well really, done. really uh, special. And uh, I, I, so that's it. Thank you so much, Emma. We really appreciate you coming and talking with us. My pleasure. Thank you all for the excellent questions. There were three or four I'd never had. So. Aha, great. We That's always the, we always try to get something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thanks, Robert. Right. That was thanks lovely. So, so good night to you. Um, good afternoon to everyone else here and uh, watching us, and uh, have a great day. <laughs>